So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the ground you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Uh, benign advice. Now, profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. Ah uh, yeah, so due to popular demand, we are bringing you another lesson with TED Talks. Now, back in the day when I taught private classes myself, I used to love using TED Talks with my students. Now, one reason they're a great resource is because they have transcripts in many different languages. And furthermore, they expose you to a wide variety of different vocabulary. But before we get into today's lesson with TED Talks, I wanted to let you know that every single week we make lessons like this with your favorite sort of media so that you can understand fast-speaking natives without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles or transcripts in this case. So if that sounds like something that you want to be able to do, then I really implore you to hit that subscribe button and the bell on below and join our community of millions of learners who are doing exactly this every single week. We're all born creative, but we start to lose that creativity over time. Not only are we taught that following certain steps and mastering certain subjects will lead to success, but we are also led to believe that perfection is everything. In this clip, Robinson describes how children are taught to fear being wrong, which limits their creativity. What these things have in common is that kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way. We stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. Picasso once said this. He said that all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it. What these things have in common is, is that kids will take a chance. We use the phrase, take a chance, to refer to something that has some risk involved, with the hopes or expectations of a positive result. It means trying something new, even if there is some uncertainty or potential for failure. For example, he had never tried sushi before, but decided to take a chance and order some at the restaurant. He was pleasantly surprised by how much he enjoyed it. Check out this example from The Devil Wears Prada. I, um... I thought you would be different. I said to myself, go ahead, take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Which of these words means the same as have a go? Leave, try, adjust. When Robinson says have a go, he means that kids will try doing something, even if they're not completely confident or skilled at it. Have a go is also a way to encourage someone to attempt something new, take a risk, or practice a new skill. For example, I've never played tennis before, but I'm willing to have a go and see how it feels. Here's an example from Thor Love and Thunder. And I've been told you can summon them with a special whistle that goes something like this. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. No, that's not it. You have a go. No, that's not it. You know, if they don't know, They'll have a go. <laughs> Am I right? Let's look at the pronunciation here. Robinson speaks quickly, and the A in am is almost silent. When the consonant M is followed by the voiced vowel sound I, the M sound is assimilated, and this causes MI to sound like my in some instances. Also notice that the T at the end of right is pronounced with a glottal stop, which is common in both British and American English. A stop T is made the same way as a regular T, only you don't let the air out. Right. Right. What we hear is, am I right? <laughs> I'm alright. <laughs> I'm alright. They're not frightened of being wrong. As Robinson uses British English, he uses a non-rhotic R when he says there. 
So while I would pronounce this word as there, using my standard American accent, he pronounces it as there. We also hear another example of the glottal stop when he says the word frightened. The glottal stop occurs in words where a syllable ends in T and the next syllable is a syllabic N or EN. So we hear frightened. Together it sounds like they are not frightened. They're not frightened of being wrong. What we do know is if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you're not prepared to be wrong. If you come up with something, it means you think of an idea, solution, or suggestion, usually in response to a problem or challenge. It can also be used to describe the act of producing or creating something new. For example, I'm trying to write a song, but I'm having some trouble coming up with the lyrics. Check out this funny example from Friends. So, you're all bored? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna close my eyes and point to someone, and you, whoever I point to has to come up with something fun for us to do, and we have to do it. Okay, all right, fan okay. out, fan out. <laughs> okay. By the way, you're learning all this fantastic vocabulary today, right? Well, a lot of learners like you tell me that they get really frustrated because they'll study vocabulary like this, but then they get an uh, opportunity to use that vocabulary and it slips their mind. They can't remember it anymore, even though they know it's in their head. Has this ever happened to you? Well, I found in my own language learning, one of the best ways to get past this is by using the new vocabulary as soon as possible after I learned it. Now we've created a powerful and free resource so that you can do exactly this anytime, anywhere at the press of a button. It's the real life app. You should totally check it out because you can have fun and dynamic conversations with other English learners just like you from all around the world. So it's absolutely free to download. As I said, you can find it in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store and make new English speaking friends today. Aw oh, yeah. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. We use the word capacity to refer to the amount or ability of something to hold or do something else. It can also refer to the ability of a person or organization to perform a particular task. For example, the athlete had the physical capacity to run a marathon, but he lacked the mental preparation. He's wonderful. Nevertheless, he is lacking in certain managerial capacities totally fair. it's fair right uh, they have become frightened of being wrong and we run our companies this by the way we stigmatize mistakes if someone or something is stigmatized they're treated as shameful or disgraceful often causing them to be looked down upon or excluded by society for example labeling a child as a troublemaker can stigmatize them and affect their self-esteem it is just perfectly normal for a younger man to be sexually attracted to a mature woman. In fact, when you stigmatize his choice, then you feed into an unhealthy narrative on masculinity in middle age. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. When Robinson says educating people out of their creative capacities, he means that often the way people are taught in schools and other educational settings can limit their ability to think creatively or come up with new ideas. They are taught to memorize, repeat information, and behave in a particular way instead of to produce original ideas or solutions. For example, many teachers work hard to ensure that they are not educating their students out of their creative capacities. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it. Now, if we grow out of something, we stop doing or experiencing it as a result of growing older or maturing. For example, I used to be scared of roller coasters, but I eventually grew out of it and now I love riding them. Here, Robinson means that as we get older, we learn and work in a way that follows someone else's expectations, instead of using our creativity. Many people are taught to believe that in order to be successful in life, they need to focus on studying subjects such as math and science, and subjects related to art are less valuable. In this clip, Robinson explains that we should encourage creativity, as it is a key part of innovation and development for the future. In other words, we should redefine our understanding of intelligence, and recognize that creativity is just as important as literacy. Our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability, and there's a reason. The whole system was invented around the world. There were no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, 
that the, the most useful subjects for work are at the top. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the ground you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Uh, benign advice. Now, profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the universities designed the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. Our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. We use the word predicated to mean that something is based on or dependent on something else. It refers to a situation where one thing must happen or be true in order for another thing to happen or be true. For example, if someone says, my success is predicated on my hard work, they mean that their success depends on the effort they put in. Do you think lying to Carmela in therapy is the best thing for your panic attacks? Things are going good between me and Carm. You said so yourself. It's all predicated on a lie. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. The phrase came into being is used to describe the moment or the process when something starts to exist or is created. For example, the company came into being in 2010 when the founders decided to start their own business. They manifested like a flame. They weren't really, really from anywhere. The conditions were right and they came into being. Industrialism describes a period in history when there was a shift from manual labor to machine-based manufacturing and production. For example, industrialism brought about many changes in society, including the development of new technologies and the growth of mass production. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, we use the word hierarchy to refer to a system or structure where people or things are arranged in order of importance or status. Which shape is commonly associated with a hierarchy? Square, circle, pyramid. A well-known hierarchy is Maslow's hierarchy or pyramid of needs. This is a theory in psychology that explains how human needs are organized and prioritized. For example, the CEO sits at the top of the company's hierarchy, followed by the management team, and then the employees. Dad's theory was you got two fighting dogs, you send the weak one away, you punish the weak one, then everyone knows the hierarchy, then everyone's happy, so? So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, you probably already know the meaning of root, which is the part of a plant or tree that typically grows underground and absorbs water and nutrients from the soil. Similarly, if one thing is rooted on something else, it means that it is based on or has its foundation in that thing. It suggests that the thing being rooted on is essential for the existence or development of the other thing. For example, the novel is rooted on the author's personal experiences. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid. Benignly is an adverb that describes behavior or action that is kind, gentle, or not intended to be harmful. For example, the doctor touched my arm benignly to let me know that the shot would only hurt for a moment. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the grounds you would never get a job doing that. The expression on the grounds is used to describe a reason or justification for something. You can think of it as being similar to because. For example, on the grounds of safety, we ask that you wear a helmet while riding your bike. So, based on your petition, you are seeking an annulment on the grounds that Mr. Geller is mentally unstable? Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Let's look at the grammar here. In English, when we speak about sports and activities, the verbs play and do are used. We commonly use the verb to do to mean engaging in or practicing certain activities. Some examples include, students who do music and art as a subject at school tend to be very creative. When we say that someone plays a musical instrument, it is a specific action that involves producing music from that instrument. On the other hand, to do music includes a wider range of musical activities, such as singing, writing, and playing music. Example, he plays the drums in his free time. Play is also used with sports and activities that have teams, rules, and competitions, such as football, chess, and golf. Example, I've been playing tennis for over 10 years. Uh, benign advice, now profoundly mistaken. 
We use the adverb profoundly to mean very deeply or to a great extent. It is used to emphasize the intensity of something, such as an emotion or an impact. For example, the book I read last night was profoundly moving and even made me cry. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. Engulfed is a verb that means to completely surround or cover something. It is often used to describe a situation where something is overwhelmed or completely consumed by something else. For example, the city was engulfed in a thick fog that made it difficult to see. Within moments, the entire Baudelaire mansion was engulfed in flames. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the universities designed the system in their image. If something dominates, it has control or power over something or someone. For example, the champion boxer dominated his opponent in the ring and won the match easily. The phrase in their image means that something has been created or made to be similar to or resemble someone or something else. For example, the robot was made in the image of its creator. Check out this example. It's been years, and still, we can't get enough. They made us in their image, with their appetites. But we can remake ourselves in any image that we like, and we haven't. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. If something is protracted, it is extended over a long period of time. For example, the protracted negotiations between the two companies finally came to an end after several months of discussions. What can we do here? Well, this lawsuit is going to be a protracted and time-consuming ordeal. So I want to take just a moment to give some thanks to one of our community members who left a comment on our recent Ratatouille lesson. So this comment comes from Margot, and she says, I don't have enough words to thank you for this amazing job you're doing with us English learners. I learned so much with every video, not only vocabulary, but cultural expressions, grammar, and having fun. It's my favorite English channel. Thank you so much. So thanks again to you, Margot. And if you want to let me know how you liked today's lesson, or maybe you want to let us know about another TED Talk that you would love a lesson with, it's really simple. Just comment down below. We read every single one of your comments. So I look forward to seeing what you have to say down below. What these things have in common you see, is that kids will take a chance. You know, if they don't know, they'll have a go. Am I right? They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. Which of these means the same as to come up with something? Create, think up, produce. Our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. And there's a reason. The whole system was invented around the world. There were no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, that the, the most useful subjects for work are at the top. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the ground you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician. Don't do art, you won't be an artist. Complete this sentence. I like to keep fit. That's why I play golf and do aerobics. Uh, benign advice. Now, profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the universities designed the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. And I think we can't afford to go on that way. If something is engulfed, it is covered completely, entering into something, under pressure. So if you enjoyed learning with TED Talks today, then next I want to invite you to watch another lesson that Kase made last year with TED Talks. Let's check out a clip from that.
I took all of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way, and just looked at those. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then to others. The other thing that they had in common, they fully embraced vulnerability.